In 1999, uh, I uh, and my wife Jennifer, we were, were brand new in, in our marriage, and we went to um, a, just a, a small gathering compared to what it is today called Passion. And uh, it was in Arlington, Texas. We sat uh, in, a, in a, you know, 40 rows back in a back section with some friends. And, um, and, and that weekend, I've got to tell you, God just said things to me God revealed things to me that continue to pay dividends in my life today. I remember one session, uh, Beth Moore was opening God's Word and preaching, and, and when Beth got done, everyone broke for lunch, and uh, they went out to get their boxes. Passion always does things with such excellence, like they fed 11,000 people lunch in 10 minutes, you know, and everyone got up to leave, and uh, my wife looked at me, and we had just been, gotten married, and I said, I feel like I just need to sit here with my notes a little bit longer and the main passage, which was Galatians 2.20. And I've got to tell you, that lunch break, that lunch break uh, was one of the single moments of conversation in my life that I look back on where God changed the trajectory of the calling on my life. I didn't get up and do a lot of things differently, but the intent behind of so much of what I did changed. And then later that night, I was a part of, uh, just in the room of, of a worship service when a guy named Charlie Hall sang Jesus um, Loves the Little Children. He sang this very simple, you know, song that we all grew up singing in BBS, you know, and, and, um, and, then he, he, and then he just led. And I just remember those moments as pinnacle moments. And I say all that to say so much of that was God giving a visionary and God giving a, a servant, you know, um, just a, an opportunity to be obedient. And that is our guest today. Louis has had a tremendous impact uh, on many of you, but I think if you talk to your youth pastor, if you talk to your college pastor, if you talk to your pastor, they would say, me too. God's just used this faithful brother uh, like a few people in our generation. And I don't know about you, but I, I'm just excited and honored that he would come to open God's word for us. Can we put our hands together? Come on, for Louis Giggly, everybody. You're like, um, uh, that's crazy uh, to spend uh, New Year's Eve ringing in 2020 in Mercedes-Benz Stadium with 18 to 25-year-olds is a big step. And I know people think, oh, Passion, you do stuff like that. No, that's crazy what we just looked at right there. But I'm up for it. And I want to personally invite you to be in Mercedes-Benz for a brand new decade, a brand new season, a brand new life. And um, what a privilege to be here today in this room, David. I came to Liberty before David was at Liberty with Jennifer. And I've seen the before, which was amazing, by the way. And now I've seen the legacy that David Nasser has been able to cultivate in these last few years at Liberty. And I just want to tell you today, it feels different in here at Convocation. And a lot of you guys weren't around a few years ago when I came maybe to Convocation the first time, but something feels different in the room today. And um, I know what it is. So if you're just nudge your neighbor and said, it's the Spirit of God, I knew that. I was just kind of pointing out that it feels good in Convocation. I know you're in between class, you got projects, you got interviews, you got stuff. But hey, just to come together in a moment and to lift up the name that no one can stand against, this holy name of Jesus, 
Come on, what a great opportunity this morning. And I just want to thank David for the way he's been leading at Liberty. Uh, Jennifer, his wife, who is obviously the best part of their uh, family and equation. And uh, to thank the team who is around him at Liberty, an amazing group of people. Uh, to thank this phenomenal team that led us in worship today. Um, what an incredible opportunity. So can we just give honor uh, to these guys who've been leading the way for spiritual formation? at Liberty in the last few days, their daughter Grace, um, their son Rudy, his wife, they are just amazing people. And other than being an Alabama fan, I love everything about David Nasser. And um, I figure if he stays at Liberty long enough, that'll all get redeemed and worked out. And then when you all win the national championship, it will displace finally David Nasser and his Alabama Crimson Tide business. I came today to share a message I've shared a few times, but when I woke up today, God just said, this is the word for today. And I want to tell you today about a text that potentially saved my life, but 100% changed my life. Uh, not, not a text from the Scripture. We're going to get into the text. I'm talking about a text on a phone. A text that changed my life. And I believe that the words of that text are going to change somebody else's life today because it's that powerful of a text. The Scripture says that the enemy prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Who believes that that's true? Anybody in this convocation got any life experience that would back that up? A few people? The Scripture says that the enemy, our enemy, prowls like a roaring lion. So, like a roaring lion, not prowls as a roaring lion, but like a roaring lion, trying to make us think he's a roaring lion, like prowling. That means that he's on the left sometimes, on the right at others. He's in front of us on some days and behind us on others. He's above us in some circumstances and below us in other circumstances. He gets in the cracks, he gets in the crevices, and he roars. And he wants to intimidate us with the roar so that we will collapse in unbelief of a God who has promised us everything we need for life and godliness. And at the end of the day, his end game is to devour you and me. And that, that just simply means to steal from your life your confidence, your sense of worth, a dream that is as big as the God we worship today, a sense of calling over your life that's bigger than money and bigger than success and bigger than your own business and bigger than a family for crying out, a sense of calling over your life that sweeps you up into the atmosphere of the Almighty and assures you that your seven-second life on planet Earth is going to matter in eternity. And that enemy is roaring today, and he roars on secular campuses, Ivy League campuses, community colleges, and he roars at places like Liberty. He roars outside the church and inside the church. He's roaring with kids who are your age today, the majority of college students in America and the world who woke up today clueless. Clueless. One more day, one more day in my junior year, one more day in my freshman year, one more day at Colgate, one more year at UCLA, one more year at Auburn, clueless. Do not know why I was created, do not know why I'm alive, do not know the potential that is in my life, do not know the God who hung the stars in space, do not know that there was an exchange called Calvary that changed my destiny, do not know that Easter is real, that the grave is over, that death is defeated and sin is finished. Do not know that guilt has been done away with, that there is no more shame and condemnation, and there is a path to a holy life, a godly life, a good life, a life that matters. Clueless. Why? Because the enemy's roaring right in their faces today. And he's saying, party it up again this week. Hook up again this week. 
Get in the right sorority, the right fraternity, get the right GPA, get on the right growth track, get the right degree, get the right internship, get the right place, get the right path, get all that. That's where it's all at. But he's not just roaring outside the church, he's roaring inside the church. And today I just want to let you know that there are a lot of things in life that you don't have control over. Amen? You don't have control over what your parents are going to do. I mean, you've tried. Uh, some of you have been the best mediator who's ever lived on planet Earth. Amen? Some of you have been a broker of peace agreements between your parents, and you have put everybody who's won a Nobel Peace Prize to shame with your effort to broker peace between your parents. But yet it didn't work, and they split up anyway. There are a lot of things like that in life that you don't have control over, but there's something in your life that you do have control over today. And it's what was in that text that I got. I want to turn us to the text today. Everybody good so far? Okay, good. I want to turn us to the text today. I think it's probably the most well-known text in the Bible. I always ask, what do you think that is? And I normally get John 3.16. Uh, not too long ago, I, I asked a group of people, what do you think is the most famous verse in the Bible? And a lady really boldly said, Jesus wept. <laughs> I was like, okay, that's an option. I hadn't really factored that into my top 10, but it's definitely the easiest verse to memorize in the Bible. What do you think is the most famous text in Scripture? I think it's this one right here. And I don't think it's John 3.16, because I think more people are familiar with what we're going to read today than any other text in Scripture. But here's what I'd love to do before we even get in. I'd like to peel off the layers of churchianity that a lot of us have experienced. Because when we start reading this passage, something's going to shift in your mind, and mostly it's going to shift the wrong direction. And I want you to see this today as one of the grittiest, guttiest texts in Scripture. And I want you to see it as God's invitation to you today. And it's found in the Psalms, Psalm chapter 23. How many of you know about Psalm 23? Can I just see a show of hands? I know it's early and getting your hands up is hard. Um, but can I just see a show of hands if you know about Psalm 23? See, I think most of us are on board. Listen to how it opens. It says, the Lord... Why don't you just say it with me because we all know it, is my shepherd. Now that's a declaration. So that's not a, a hope or a could be. This is David, a guy who at one time in his life was a shepherd, who became a king, was a warrior, was a leader, was a husband, was a failure, was a success, was a musician. This guy was a boss, this guy that's writing this. And he's making a declaration at this point in his life. And he says, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, what, is it, what he's admitting there is that he needed a shepherd, and all of us do. But he's deciding and declaring who his shepherd is going to be. And he says, because of this declaration, this reality that the Lord is my shepherd, here comes one of the most phenomenal statements that any human being can make. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. Now, we just glaze right past that text, and a lot of times when we think about it, grandma comes up, or some needlepoint that's on a pillow at our aunt's house, or cross-stitching on a frame thing at, on the back of the dining room wall at our granny's place or something like that, we sort of shift over into senior adult mentality, not knocking senior adults, obviously, that I am one. So I'm not knocking that, but we shift over into this mentality of, oh, isn't that sweet? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. Isn't that all wonderful? I want you to listen to this one sentence. If I can get into the reality of having confidence that God Almighty in the person of Jesus, He's leading me. Then the corollary of that is going to be, I'm not going to be in want. I'm not going to lack for anything internally or externally in my life. I'm not going to be living at a disadvantage. I'm not going to be another statistic 
of our generation, and you heard me say it before, I would never try to lump your generation into a big pile and really say anything about you because I'm not you. But I am not stupid either. And so I know that right now in this world, anxiety and depression and suicide are at an all-time high. The lion is available, but the enemy seems to be roaring louder. And the want is, I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know if I'm ever going to recover. I don't know if I'm ever going to make it through this. I don't know if I'm ever going to be back to 100% of me. And I'm meeting so many people these days, and they're happy, I'm not kidding you, with making it out of the darkness and back into the light. And they're thinking, hey, I'm only 49% of, of 100% of me, but I'll take the 49% and I'm just kind of roll with that. And God is saying, no, I came out of the grave so that you could be 100% of what I created you to be, what I'm dreaming for you to be. You can be all that I want you to be, but you've got to get the right shepherd going if you want to move into a position of life of not being in want. The promises, man, they just roll. If you're a Bible student, you know that you look for the verbs in text, and that's where all the, the horsepower is in the text, and it's pretty amazing. This shepherd of mine, Jesus, he's going to make me lie down in green pastures. That's another sermon for another day. It just simply means, though, that we're not smart enough to lay down in green pastures by ourselves. So when he's saying, I want to be your shepherd, you're going to be my sheep, he's not saying, hey, you're amazing. You're, you're this fluffy, little cuddly, little cute lamb, and I can't wait to get you on my shoulder because you're so awesome and adorable, and I just love how cute you are. He's saying, when he's saying, I want to be your shepherd, you're like a sheep. And, and just one example, a sheep has a lot of wool but not a lot of IQ. And so if a sheep goes to a fast running brook, I don't know if I can still stay in light over here, and it's thirsty, it will lean down and it will put its head down. I can't really, you know, do the whole thing and I'm afraid my sweater's gonna go up and then that's not gonna bless somebody over there, so I'm working hard here. But it will put its head down in the stream. Like, yeah, water, I'm thirsty, whoa! The next thing, the wool on the head is wet, pull, slips a little, because sheep are not very agile, can't see good, and now shoulders are in, eh, foot slipped, and now the sheep is in the fast-moving stream with a lot of wet wool on. going toward the rapid. That's why a shepherd has a crook. He might can get there in time and grab it by the neck and pull it to the side. So when God is saying, I want to be your shepherd, he's not saying, you're the most awesome, intelligent, great decision-making, agile person of all time. He's saying, you need help and assistance, and I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to, I'm going to make you lie down in a green pasture because sometimes you're going to just go so fast and so far and so hard, you're going to end up in the psych ward. You're going to go so fast and so far and so hard, you're going to end up in divorce court. You're going to go so fast and so far and so hard, you're going to end up on something. So I'm going to have to at times go, I'm going to need to make you lie down in a good spot and chill for a minute. I want to lead you beside the still waters, the ones you can actually drink from. I want to restore your soul. So that's three big words right there. I want to guide you in paths of righteousness for my name's sake. And check this out. And even if you do walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm going to be with you. Therefore, you don't have to fear anything. 
I'm going to prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. I'm going to anoint your head with oil. Your cup, you're not going to be walking around looking like, hmm, what do you got? Hmm, 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 hmm. Your cup's going to overflow. You're going to have an overflowing life. This is going to be the path and the plan for you. I'll anoint your head with oil. Your cup will overflow. And, and surely goodness and love are going to lead you and follow you all the days of your life. Would you like that? I'm asking. Would you like that? Would you like that kind of life? Wouldn't we like that kind of life? And if we would, he would. If we will abandon all other shepherds, like this boy is not going to be my shepherd. Now, he could be my boy, my man, no offense to the guys, my husband, but he is not going to be my ultimate shepherd. No, he's going to lead our family. I'm already praying for him, and God knows who he is, and he's going to be the greatest leader of all the leaders in mankind, and he's going to lead our family and our children, and he is going to be a shepherd to our clan. Good luck with that. Because <laughs> if he doesn't have the shepherd, you got the wrong shepherd. And even if he has the right shepherd, God's never said to you, I'll be your shepherd unless you can find Dylan. And Dylan rocks, so you won't need me anymore. I'll be your shepherd unless you get the job at Goldman Sachs. And then they can be your shepherd. They can pay the bills and give you the bonuses and give you the big life and put you on the fast track, and you won't need me anymore once you get Goldman Sachs. Instead of saying, I abandon all other shepherds, Instagram will not be my shepherd. Because I'm telling you, <laughs> hello, it ain't going to lead you to a cup that's running over. It's going to lead you to a life of envy of other people's false reality. While God wants to give you a reality, not so that you can broadcast it, but so that you can enjoy life. It's a new concept, I know. That's something that you'll need to chew on and think about for a while. That God wants, this is, an, this is why they bring older people to convocation. I was going to say old, and I was kind to myself. See how I did that? That's why they bring older people to convocation. God doesn't want to move in your life so that you can broadcast it. He wants to move in your life so that you can have the very best in your life. And broadcasting it oftentimes corrupts instantaneously the prize of having a shepherd who's leading you. Now, I'm a big Instagram fan, so I can say that. I'm not over here saying I don't, I don't have a phone and you know, my flip phone doesn't yet operate on a strong enough platform to have any digital social medias. But God is inviting. The verse I want to drill down into just for a few minutes is in the middle of this psalm, and it's one that perplexed me for a long time. I've, in fact, I, I, I thought surely this is a, a mistranslation somehow. I mean, they must have just not been paying attention. Because right in the middle, it says, you, my shepherd, prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, I don't know if you have any enemies or not. Real enemies, like people talking about you, people talking behind your back, people trying to run you down, uh, people who just flat out don't like you people who are attacking you. Maybe you have some real enemies like that in the world. But we got all kind of enemies inside and outside in our lives. And we got this big roaring, like a lion enemy around our lives. 
And so God's making a promise as a shepherd. He says, I'm going to prepare a table before you, that's you and me, in the presence of of your enemies. Now, when I read that, I'm like, if I had written the 23rd Psalm, and trust me, there are a lot of passages I'm thinking, I I wish I could have just written that part or that part. If I'd written that verse, here's how I would have been tempted to write that verse. You, my shepherd, now that I've chosen you, you prepare a table before me in your presence. Did you see how that sounded better? You're God, and I'm your love son, love daughter, so no matter what's going on, whatever the circumstances are happening, whether it's a collapse in my family or a diagnosis or the economy that's happening globally or something that's happening in my dorm or my community group or something that's happening in a relationship or whatever's happening in the world, you, God, prepare a table before me in your presence, because in your presence, you said, is fullness of joy, and I just want to be in your presence. He said, no, that's not the promise. I'm going to do something cooler than that. I'm going to do something more revolutionary than that. I'm going to do something more God-sized than that. I'm going to actually prepare the table before you in the presence of the enemies that are around you. Wow. That's a game changer. Let me show you how it works. It says, if God was saying to you, um, I'll take my Bible with, if that's okay. Um, I'm supposed to go down the stairs over there, but I don't have time. Um, it says, if God were saying to you, I am going to prepare a table for two. And I mean, it is a liberty S table too, friends. This ain't no cardboard table. This is not some janky fellowship hall table. This is legit. And it's a table for two. I just need you to lock into this idea because I don't have a lot of time to unpack all of it. I want you to think about the crazy promise of Psalm 23 and see if you believe it or not today. Almighty God offering to you a table for two. You're like, well, can Jennifer come? We're not talking about Jennifer right now. This is about the primary promise of God for you. Almighty God and you at a table. And I'm telling you, when God invites you to the table, he must think you have been on the 77-day Daniel fast because he's coming strong. Would you like an olive? I mean, he's a Mediterranean carpenter. Okay, you go veggie if you want, carrot. Well, who's sitting at this table? Right, there's no way you put food out in front of college students before lunch. <laughs> and he, he wants to join you. Like a cupcake, they're especially good. <laughs> Hi. How you doing? Can I get you a little more water? Awesome. How's life? You good? I'm good. In fact, (laughs) you don't even need to ask. No problems. Everybody's good at home. Family's good. Universe is good. I feel great. Slept great. Oh, that's right. I don't sleep. Um, Good. (laughs) Just great. Fantastic. How are you? Are you hungry? Would you like some fruit? Here, have some. Listen, can I just say something? This is absurd! <laughs> Hi. I just, I, I'm asking Holy Spirit, please help. This, sorry. Um, didn't mean to do that. This is crazy. It's like, hey, this is amazing and awesome, and thanks for the carrots. I, I have to run get this text right now, and I've got to make a phone call. I'll be right back. <laughs> hey, what's up, man? How y'all doing? What are y'all up to? I 
I don't know. I'm not feeling good right now. I hate statistics. I'm going to just say it. I I hate it. And turns out Jeremy is a punk. These, these are our conversations. That's our invitation. And we are walking around like idiots, talking about things smaller than snails' footprints, stressed about the smallest things. And the Almighty has said, hi, good morning, come, come sit down, eat, let's talk, let's hang out, let's, how are you? <laughs> Do you mind if I just kneel down for a moment? That same thing about my belt not being the right size, sorry. (laughs) What's happening here? This is what it's all about. And it's a table for two. But here's the trick this whole enemy prowling around thing, he's slick. Do you believe it? Do you really? I'm just checking. You have your Bible open. I'll ask you. Um, I'm just kidding. I love you. I love you, and that jacket is on fire. Do you believe he's prowling around? Yes. Do you believe he's slick? Yes. Is he quick? Yes. Yes, he's quick. He's so quick that if you're not paying attention... Hey, how you doing? How's it going? Good to see you. Do you mind? I had my allergies kill me. How's it going today? Do you, do you mind? It's a long, long journey. So, how's it going? How's things with your roommate, Alicia. <laughs> I'm telling you, I don't know how you do it. Like, I think you should get an award, the prize, something, recognition, being a paper, you should get like a Liberty Scholarship of some kind for being able to live with that piece of work for your entire <laughs> sophomore year. You hear what she said to Melinda? Oh, no, crazy. What the nerve! I watch out for her. Look at her. How is your depression going? Not good? Medication working? No. That's all right. You'll make it. Maybe. A lot of people aren't making it right now. You're doing better than a lot of people because a lot of people are like closing down and freaking out and going to the psych ward. Bipolar. You know how that is, right? Crazy. How class. I told you. I told you not to be an engineer. Not for you. I said, did I not say, be an art major? Did I not tell you that? You want a bite? Yeah, we'll have some. And before you know it, listen. This is so ridiculous and stupid. Before you know it, he is sitting at your table. (laughs) 
I used to tell a story about this guy, and I feel terrible because I've never figured out how to tell the story without making me look like a jerk and making the guy look not cool, and he was cool, and I'm not a jerk, mostly. <laughs> but Shelly and I were having a birthday dinner in another country, and it was something we planned for a long, long time. Nasser will understand this. He's a phenomenal planner. And we'd gotten to the deal. It was all going fantastic. We were sitting at this table. It was a four top, but it was just me and her. And we were having dinner, and this um, middle-aged guy comes by, and he looks twice, and he comes, looks back, and he's like, are you Louis Giglio? And I'm like, I am. So I never thought I'd see you in another country. I know, I know, it's crazy. I get out of America occasionally. And he goes, it's just so good to see you. I just want to say thank you. I was at a conference recently, and you spoke, and blah, 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 and da-da-da, and it was awesome. And I just wanted to thank you. That's just all I really wanted to say. And I was like, gosh. And he walks off, and Shelly and I do it. We do like 10 times a day. We're like, what kind of life are we living? How, how blessed is it to be in God's story? And we went back to having this amazing birthday meal that we had planned for a long time. And about five minutes later, I see the guy coming back from the entrance of the restaurant. He's kind of winding his way through the tables. And I'm like, babe, this guy must have left his wallet or his glasses or his keys or something on the table. He's coming back. And so I'm just going to try to hurry the process. And hey, got your glasses. Sorry. He comes back. He says, <clears throat> this might be kind of awkward, but I've really been wanting to talk to you for a long time about something God's been speaking to me in my life. And, and when I got outside, I thought, when am I ever going to see Louis Giglio again? And here we were in this foreign country, in the same restaurant together, and I thought, sure enough, this is the moment God wants me to tell you about the vision that he's given me for my life. Now, I'm just running the risk here because this is the part where I look like the jerk. And so I said, I'm not, I'm not trying to confuse you, I'm not the enemy, but I'm just going to sit in this chair for a minute because Shelly was right here. I said, um, oh man, that would be so great, except that it's my wife's birthday. And he says, happy birthday. Anyway, so what, and at that point, I moved from being in the spirit, if I was in the spirit, to fully now being in the flesh. And I'm like, uh, so I know somebody in the rooms right now, you missed an opportunity. You didn't listen to the Holy Spirit. You, maybe the world was going to change and nations would have been saved and you should have listened. But it was my wife's birthday and I felt pretty solid about it. And he pulls the chair back and says, do you mind if I join y'all? Let's we'll take a poll, David. <laughs> Who feels nervous and a little bit sweaty palmed right now about this whole situation? <laughs> How many of you feel like I miss the Lord? You'll pray for me. Thank you. I was just like, I don't think you're going to be able to stay. It's like, you, you want me to go? It's like, and then we just laugh, not, not at him. I'm not, he's an awesome guy. I met the guy later, phenomenal guy, love him. Social skills need to be honed slightly, but amazing guy. And I just said, how fast? We can be in our process, and then just almost before you even know it, the enemy's at your table. You're like, well, how would I know if he was at my table? I'll give you a couple of really super fast ways. Number one way you know is if you're thinking in convocation today that it's better at another table, the enemy is at your table. And don't you tell me that there's not somebody in this convocation today about to make a really bad decision in your life. And the reason you're going to make that decision is not because you're under stress or under pressure or blah, 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 or this, that, and the other. It's because the enemy sat down at your table and convinced you that there is something better than sitting at the table with Almighty God. And you believed him after a probably a long, slow burn process, and now you are eyeing another table, another, another possibility outside of a relationship with the creator of the universe. And I'm just telling you right now, the enemy's at your table. Another way you'll know the enemy's at your table is if you're thinking or feeling right now that you're not going to make it. I talked about it earlier, but if there's been any thought, any process in your mind in the last little while, I'm not going to make it, I'm not going to get through this, I'm not going to survive this, I'm never going to be the same after this, I'm telling you the enemy is at 
your table. Because God said to you, even if we go through the valley of the shadow of death, you don't have to fear evil because I'm with you. And I know you've heard this before and we've said it a lot before, but living in the reality of it, reality of it is altogether different. He's saying, we're not going to any valleys, we're going through all the valleys. This shepherd does not lead you to death and then drop you off. He doesn't lead you to struggle and drop you off. He doesn't lead you to challenges and then drop you off. He doesn't lead you into the thick of the fight and then just drop you off. He says, no, we're going through the valley, me and you. And we're gonna have a story to tell on the other side. And if you don't believe that today, then you can be confident the enemy is at your table. And here's the weird thing. We start repeating the conversations of the enemy at our table. And you said to your friend when they said, hey, how you feeling? And you said to them, what? I don't know if I'm going to make it. Where did you get that idea? Did you get that idea from this guy right here sitting here at the table with you? Going, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I declare the start from the finish and you are my son, you are with me, and you are going to be with me. We are going to do this together. And it's gonna be awesome. Not easy every day. But trust me, we're gonna make it. Therefore, when your friend says, how you doing, you say, it's hard, but I'm gonna make it. How you know you're gonna make it? Breakfast this morning. Who'd you have breakfast with? I didn't know you were going to breakfast with someone. Had a good breakfast this morning. Had a good meeting this afternoon. Had a good sit down today and I'm gonna make it. I'll tell you another way you know the enemies at your table. Mentioned it earlier. If you if you've got any thoughts in your mind right now that you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you're not pretty enough, you're not from the right family, you're not in the right group at Liberty, you're not in the right dorm, you're not on the right thing. The enemy is at your table. So don't ask any of us to feel sorry for you because you don't feel good enough. You need to get a new shepherd. And you need to sit down with a creator who says in John 10, 10, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. And guess what? Let me tell you how that plays out from Psalm 23 to me now. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jason, let me explain that to you. I chose you. I love you. I value you. I will never bail on you. I will never let you down. I will never leave you. I will never, never, ever stand you up. I won't abandon you, and I'm not going to fight you. I'm going to give my life for you because I love you that much. How many kids at Liberty today are walking into class feeling like they're not good enough, they're not smart enough, they're not pretty enough, they're not whatever enough? When the shepherd said, I got a table here to tell you, you mean everything to me. And then I'll just close and almost forgot about the text that changed my life. The enemy's at your table, he's telling you that you're surrounded and that potentially everybody's against you. I was at a place like that in my life. I've been at all the places we've talked about today, by the way. I spent about four and a half months of my life a few years ago in a hole called depression and anxiety that I didn't think I would ever make it out of. I didn't go to church. I didn't go to meetings at the office. I didn't go to dinner with friends. I didn't go to walk in the cul-de-sac with my wife. I was medicated, and I was on the verge of a total wipeout. So when I talk about depression and anxiety today, I didn't come here because I read something in a newspaper article. I am a standing miracle of the grace of God and the power of God to bring us out of the pit 
and to stand us on our feet again to the glory and the grace of God. A few years past that, I got into a real sticky place in life. I did not in any way see it coming. And I I, I don't want to get into all the specifics of that today. Just to say enough, I felt under attack. I felt surrounded. In some ways, I felt betrayed. And I texted a friend of mine who I knew had my back. You know who that is for you? Everybody else bails. Amanda's going to be there. She's got my back, which is great. And thank you, Amanda. You're awesome. But come on, Amanda's five foot four. (laughs) I'm not knocking that. That's fantastic. I'm just saying you're going to face some stuff you're going to need bigger than five four four. And so I texted my guy, long text. I'm a 60-year-old person. So for me to compose the text I needed to get out, like you're not going to believe what happened, you are not going to believe it when I tell you this, can you believe that that's what happened? I know, it's insane, and blah, 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 blah. When you're texting your woes, it takes a minute. And I texted a text about this long. Someone my age, that takes about 45 minutes. (laughs) And I hit send because I knew I was going to get back what I needed in the fight. And so I just stared at my phone. You ever sent one of those texts where you don't go anywhere? You just wait? And you're like, don't send me back an emoji. (laughs) I need a commensurate reply. You might know what I'm talking about. At least as long as the text I sent you. I need that back. (laughs) Not, got you, bro. Be lifting you up. Pound it. And finally, the little wheel started turning, and the text came back. And I thought, surely you hit send too soon, (laughs) because there's not enough words on my screen right now to respond to what I just sent you. I was so mad. I didn't even read it. I was just like, are you kidding me? Surely there's more coming. Ain't nothing else coming. So I just read the text, and it changed my life. You want me to tell you what the text said? It said, don't give the enemy a seat at your table. And everything changed. You do not have control of everything today. In fact, you don't have control of most things today. But you have control of who's at your table. And you can say in the power of Almighty God today, you can prowl around. Apparently, that is what you do. But you can not sit down at this table. This table is a table for me and my shepherd. And you don't have a seat at my table. Oh, come on, church. I realized I was in conversations every day with a killer. And I was talking to him and letting him talk to me. And it all changed that day when I said, the Lord is my shepherd. I'm making a new declaration. And he prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Not his presence. Oh, his presence is in the presence of the enemies. But you know why it's in the presence of the enemies? So that every circumstance, in every situation, in every adversary, in every attacker, in every enemy is going to have to sit there and watch the Son of God, the daughter of God, at a table where there is abundance, at a table where there is love, at a table where there is victory, at a table where I I am filled to overflowing. So I'm no longer saying, I got to hoard it all. Man, this is all my stuff. I got to keep all this because I don't know who's coming. Oh, I'll knock you out before you knock me out. Don't you think I'm a pushover? Oh, don't you try me. I'll cut you. (laughs) Thank you, Lord, for giving me all this blessing. I'm so grateful for it all. 
No. You go to your enemies and you say, hey, how you doing? Good morning. Hey, I'm sorry I messed those up on my sweater, but have some. Hi, how are you all today? So good to see you, Amanda. You're doing awesome. Here, have some. I've got plenty. Oh, no, eat them all. I've got a whole table full. Go to the vegetarian section over here. Hey, guys, look. Just have some. Pass it around. And all of a sudden, you're living this life that says, I don't need clenched fists. I don't need to hoard God's blessing. I actually can walk around to all the people who maybe aren't even on my side right now and just say, hey, be blessed, man. Be blessed. I'm telling you what, I just want you to have a a blessing. I want you to have some some watermelon. Uh, Here, just have the whole thing. Because I've got a table, and it was never about what was on the table. It was always about who was at the table, and he is all I need. He's all I need. So, Lord, we come today against a roaring, empty promise, an intimidator with no power, no real ultimate authority, only deceit and sham and games and lies. And we stand against him, against his spirit of anxiety, against his spirit of depression, against his spirit of deceit and comparison. In the name of Jesus. And I pray that in the days to come, it would be true that those who look to you, their faces are radiant. And the glory you receive is the world watching your sons and daughters be filled right in the middle of the battle. We love you. You are such a good shepherd. Forgive us for bailing on you so often and renew us today to being yours. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you, buddy. Hey, listen. Um, I think fittingly enough, um, we always have our shepherds and our resident shepherds who are available to you. If you just sense that maybe God is speaking to you today, don't walk out of here. Don't be in such a rush to go out without just really maybe sitting with someone and having a discussion that I think could just literally shift just so much of what you're going through right now. All right, so our resident shepherds and our shepherds, if you'd be available, shepherds, if you'll just come and kind of hover up here in the front. We have 275 resident shepherds. Make yourself available to them as well. Can we thank Louis just for his obedience and preaching God's word? We love him. We'll see you at Passion 2020, brother. Hey, we'll see you tonight. It's going to be an amazing night. Again, make sure you go and see the folks about the uh, bone marrow transplant opportunity. We'll see you tonight, 630. See you there.